So uh, thanks, Sean, for, for the introduction. Uh, so my name is Martin, and I'm going to share with you some of the actually three main learnings we had on our journey when we uh, moved our test automation to the cloud. Uh, so maybe uh, following up on the last meetup we had, uh, I want to know how many of you have actually worked with, with Appium before? Okay, so like 50-50. So I'll try to, to cover some of the basics as well to make it uh, useful for, for all of you. So yeah, um, we're working at, at Carousel. I think uh, the name should be familiar to, to most of you. Um, and the challenge we had is we target different platforms. We have an Android app, we have an iOS app, and we also have our application on the web. So we have three platforms that we need to test. And we're in quite a lucky situation that the company understands that automation is very important, and we have quite a few resources to work on this goal, which is automate everything we can, automate as much as we can. Oh, sorry. So this is, this is the current focus we, we have. And um, the first step was for test automation on mobile devices. Uh, we're using Appium for that. I think the solution has been around for a bit over a year. And we started very humble with a couple of phones. So on the left side, this is actually uh, the device farm uh, in our office, like three stories uh, upstairs. So you can see we have, I think it's uh, two iPhones and two Android phones, and we use these four devices to run all our tests. Um, and at some point, we thought about how does that scale? How will it work if we need to run more tests? And does it make sense for us to, to move that to the cloud? So I want to talk a little bit about what are the pros and cons about doing that yourself versus doing it uh, on a... Uh, with a cloud cloud based solution, I think the right side is uh, some cloud farm in China, so these are four phones here you can actually scale that up as much as you want and there are some quite good open source tools, especially for Android, how to uh, maintain these these device farms so for us, um, some of the issues we found when doing doing our own device farm. It's hard to maintain. We have to, to maintain the phones ourselves. We have to update the phones ourselves. When something doesn't work, then we have to reboot the phone, all, all these sort of things. And also, obviously, we are very limited to which phones we can use. So these were the two main considerations when we looked into uh, cloud-based testing. Um, and as we thought about it a little bit more, we, re we realized there are actually couple other factors that we, we need to consider. So what types of models are available? So maybe give you a little bit of background how our testing, uh, uh, testing approach works. So we have a set of, right now it's about 100 uh, scenarios that we run. Uh, we call them sanity tests. So to check the basic health, uh, basic sanity of our application. So with every build, or at least with every release, we run all these tests and see if they are still successful. Uh, at first, when we came up with these test cases, it had to be done manually, and then gradually over time, we automated more and more of them. So this is one part. It's like about 100 uh, tests takes altogether between two to three hours, and we have to target at least Android and iOS. Ideally, we target as many phones as we can. This is one uh, scenario. The other one, what we want to reach is that with every change someone does to the application, we have a set of tests that we run to see does this uh, pull request on GitHub uh, breaks anything that is very important to our application. So does it, for example, break a login, break some other basic functionality? Can I still list an item on Carousel and, and things like this? So we take a subset of these 100 tests and run them with every uh, code commit. So this is uh, it's like it's a roughly 50 a day. So you can imagine you need uh, quite a few phones and you need to have them stable so that you can get the feedback on time. 
So this is one factor to consider uh, which devices does the cloud offer. And if you don't go for cloud but do it yourself, then you need to buy these phones yourselves. Then you have maximum freedom, but like every half year, you probably need to buy new uh, uh, um, a new flagship uh, phone for Android or the new iPhone and invest like almost a thousand dollars. And also a thing that's worth it to consider how often do these cloud providers get new phones. And the next part is uh, how does the cloud solution integrate with what we already have or what you already have uh, does it integrate seamlessly into like build pipeline, we use Jenkins or, or whatever, Travis CI or Circle CI? Does it maybe even come with plugins that um, integrate very easily or is there a lot of refactoring necessary? And the third part is also very important, uh, already mentioned before, maintenance of the devices. If you have your own device, cloud, you're responsible, you have to do that. This is something that's often overlooked that when you look at the cost of how much does a cloud provider charge you, you overlook that if you do it yourself, it's cheaper, but then you need still pay, uh, invest uh, man hours to, to do the maintenance. Uh, another one is availability. So how a lot of these uh, cloud providers work, um, it's like a public service and they have a number of phones and you say, I wanna test against an iPhone X and if an iPhone X is available, you can run your test and otherwise you need to wait. Or they offer uh, private devices and say, we buy an iPhone X, which is uh, exclusively for you and you can use it all the time. So these are the two um, main, uh, main ways they are doing that. Sorry. So we have couple of guys joining remotely and apparently they can't see our screen. Uh, okay. Yeah, so next one. Uh, Extensibility, so how easy, again, it's uh, somewhat linked to the other one. How does it integrate in the build pipeline that's already there? Uh, are there other are plugins? Is there open source, uh, uh, open source community around? Is there a good community, good forum support? And most important turned out for us, does it have a good API? Like cloud solution that doesn't have an API, you, and then it doesn't support something you need, you're kind of lost. And last but not least, uh, how much does it cost? So uh, we did a lot of evaluation. We looked into all different sorts of, uh, of providers like uh, Browser Stack, Bitbar, pCloudy, AWS Device Farm, and a couple of others. And I want to talk about some of the learnings uh, from the POC with AWS. So AWS is... Okay, Amazon Web Services, they also have device form. And the model we're using is a uh, public, uh, public cloud. So they have, uh, I think it's safe to say 100 different models, probably even more publicly available. And you can run your Appium tests against them. So the first learning um, when we looked at all these uh, solutions is they all have their limitations. None of them is perfect. But since one of my mentors at a previous company always used to say it's only software, so if it doesn't do what you want, you extend it and make it do what you want. So it's always possible to work around some of the, um, some of the issues or, or fix them in some way. So the first problem we run into uh, how many of you are familiar with Cucumber using feature files for, for the tests? So yeah, we did that as well. And we're quite proud of having our like, nice set of feature files, like more than 100 scenarios. And then you look at AWS and they say, yeah, we're sorry, we cannot run Cucumber. Uh, the way it works 
uh, you have to compile your, your test suite, upload that as a zip file to AWS, and then uh, they run it for you. And there were a lot of people in the forums that, yeah, we want to use your service, but we're stuck with Cucumber. We don't want to migrate, and we don't want to rewrite all, all our tests. And I, th I don't know what they did in the end, maybe go somewhere else. So we were in the same situation. It doesn't support what we need, but we do not want to rewrite all our tests. So um, what we did it might sound a little bit hacky at first, but it turned out to, to work pretty well. I'm not sure everyone can see that. It's quite small. So this is an example of, of how our feature files look. So for example, uh, we have something called coins on carousel. So one test is if I set the coin balance to 1,500 via an API call, so that has nothing to do with the user interface. And then I log in as a user, I check how many coins does that user have, does it match? So this is just a very basic check for uh, displaying of the coin balance. And then we have uh, two more coin related tests. So the reason AWS cannot uh, run Cucumber is usually when you run Cucumber with JUnit or TestNG, uh, the way it works, you have a JUnit runner that takes care of um, actually running Cucumber and running these scenarios. And AWS doesn't support custom runners, so you need, you need to have plain JUnit tests. So something and just has test methods and the test annotation that they can run. So what we did, we wrote the parser that parses the uh, feature file and then generates these uh, JUnit tests. So I think the easiest way to understand what I'm talking about is just showing. So we use uh, Appium and Cucumber with um, with Java, and we use Maven as our build tool. So, I'll just run this command, maybe make that a little bit bigger too. So this is our, our test project. I uh, just ran the generate sources goal. What that does, parses all our uh, maybe 20 something feature files, and generates these JUnit tests. So we have a uh, we have a template. It says, okay, this test class should look look like this. It's actually very simple, kind of ugly in a way, but it works really well. And for every uh, every feature file is corresponds to one uh, Java class and every scenario in that feature is one test method. And this is something that uh, AWS can actually run. How did you know that this will work by AWS like, responsible for uh, This approach, uh, we didn't know. We hoped that it would. <laughs> it, it was worth a try. No, um, I had kind of a hunch that the way they work is you can, because they support JUnit, they support TestNG, they support all that, but they don't support Cucumber. So the only reason they don't support Cucumber is what you usually have. Um, I can't, why can't I edit this? Okay. Uh, let me show you. Yeah, what you usually have if you run Cucumber tests, so this is a small runner class for us to um, to run things uh, locally. Uh, you have an annotation that tells it run with the JUnit, uh, with the sorry, with the Cucumber runner, and then you can pass a couple of options. And since they don't support that, so I, we got rid of the custom runner and created some. Oh, sorry created some plain and simple uh, JUnit tests. No. And yeah, I didn't see any reason why it shouldn't work, so it was, it was worth a try. 
Um, yeah, so basically what this does, uh, Cucumber has a Cucumber main uh, class where you can, it's basically what the runner also executes, where you can run features and you pass in um, what package are my step definitions, where are my feature files, so this is uh, the path to the feature files and the step package. There you also need to do a little trick because um, you cannot access the uh, the cucumber cannot runner cannot access the feature files inside the jar file, so you need to extract it to the file system and then read it from there. Um, yeah, and then cucumber has this nifty little um, syntax how you can just run a single scenario. I didn't know that, and I didn't believe that this actually exists. Uh, you just specify the line number. So I think they added this feature later on and then they didn't have any better way of doing it. So let's see, this is adds visibility. So this should be here. Uh, user should be able to view ads. This is in line six. Yeah. So this matches to this one scenario. I mean, that's just the way uh, Cucumber works. So then we also had to do uh, some things about making sure the method name and the class name is proper, camel case, and valid, Java. But then it actually worked, worked out pretty well. So the next step after that, and on that, AWS is quite good when it comes to uh, to documentation. So the features they have, they are quite well documented. They tell you exactly how you can package uh, your project to, uh, to to get it to run. So they have the whole Maven configuration there and you can basically just use that. So when we then run uh, Maven package, so this will do the same. So you don't, you don't have to run it, both of them. I'll just show you step by step. So this first generates uh, the JUnit classes, then compiles them in the, in the next phase, and then packages the way that AWS needs it. So uh, it's one big zip file that includes all our classes and the Java files of all the dependencies. So it gets pretty big, but it works. Okay, I give a full demo of, of that briefly uh, in one of the next uh, steps. I'll just move on here. So, and the second, the second learning, and that is actually something I already encountered at another company I was working for with a different uh, product. And a lot of these products we're looking at, they don't have that. So especially when you talk about you want to uh, use your automated tests in a build pipeline and you need to uh, run them in a short time and you need to run a lot of tests in a short time, you need to find a way to distribute them on multiple devices. So if you have 100 tests and we probably scale up to several hundred, we cannot just run them on one device because it will take too long. So we need a way to say we have 300 tests, we have let's say 10 different phones and we want a solution that we just send these tests and it will distribute them. Uh, so this is very important for integrating in a, in a CI. And it's quite surprisingly that this is not a standard feature. This is something that a lot of companies who build test automation tools don't, cannot do out of the box. So if you're ever in a situation where you build something like that, please start with that. Because it's, it's really, really, it makes a big difference. And there are a lot of people who need to work around that and find a way how they can still uh, achieve what they want to achieve. I see a lot of no nodding going on. So, uh, I think s others have, this, have the same issues. Um, so, as far as I'm concerned, there are two ways how you can do this. Uh, one is you just 
you take your test tube of like 100 tests and split it up into smaller chunks. Like if we have four devices and I have 100 tests and I have 25, 25, 25, uh, I have four chunks of, of 25 that I can then uh, run all these 25 chunks on, on each phone. Comes with, is the easier approach, but it comes with some downsides as well. I'm going to talk about that too. And the second one is you just have a queue and you put all your 300 tests and then you have a worker that sees, okay, which phone is available? This phone will run the next test that comes along. Uh, either way, uh, when, you, when you go for something like that, you build that yourself, you might lose some features that the test framework, in our case, AWS already has. Maybe they have some reporting. Reporting doesn't work if you, or doesn't work that well because then you, if you split it up, you don't have one report, all of a sudden you have five reports. But you wanna have like a single report that tells you how did your, what's the status of your, of your release, so then you need to aggregate those again. So yeah, um, one solution I talked about is you, you have a queue. So in this very simple scenario, we have three phones available and we have five tests. So we queue them all up and then First test runs on device one, next on two, three, one. And then let's say device two is not is still running the test, so the next one uh, on, on the other one, it's actually faster, so then the last one will come here. And if we distribute using chunks, we predefine which test will run on which phone, and then just start it simultaneously. The downside with this is you have a lot of manual effort to make sure that the chunks are, um, are kind of the same size. Because if the first, if you just do like, uh, the, the very first approach would be, okay, one, two on one, two, th uh, three, four on two, and the last one on three. And then it can happen that one slot takes twice as long. So you need to balance out um, that it, it's kind of the same duration. Because in the end, if you trigger them at the same time, you still need to wait until all of them finish. Yeah, um, I mean, coming to, to AWS, uh, again, some research, as with all the other uh, platforms we looked into, they don't support what is called test charting, is what I just talked about. So again, uh, I had some, some sleepless nights and think, thought about what, what can we do. Uh, so on AWS, on the public cloud, there's a bit of an overhead for each test execution. So they have a setup that uh, sets up the phone and they have a teardown and it all takes a bit of time. So the first solution to have a queue doesn't work because then you have to go through the setup for every single test. So we needed to, to split it up. And <clears throat> to handle the reporting issue, we use, already before we were using something called TestRail, it's a test management uh, solution. Uh, there are a couple others as well, but we're quite happy with that. Uh, and the basic concept is the same, whatever you use. So we use that as an umbrella over all the test executions. We create one test run on TestRail, then we create all these test packages that we've seen before. Um, and we upload our, our application and then we trigger executions. Right now, I think we're using four or five. And then these executions will run at the same time and report results back to the same uh, test rail run. And then once all the tests are complete, we can close the run and it's done. So as I said, it's like kind of an, having an umbrella over uh, the, the separate executions. Oh, let me demo the, this as well. So for that, let's have a look at our Jenkins. Can I make this larger? Yes. So I don't want to go into, <clears throat> into too much detail. It's all still work in progress, so it looks a bit hacky. Uh, but basically what's happening, um, we have a, a Maven command for, for every slot. 
And the first one also downloads the uh, APK or IPA file of the latest version that is released. So we provide a URL where we have a small uh, web service that provides these. Um, and we'll, we'll create the run on test rail. So it's basically just a bunch of properties that you need to uh, pass in. So this is the project of test rail, the test suite, and which test plan. So we have one test plan for Android, another one for iOS, and yeah, different plans for sanity and our, um, we call them fast feedback tests or uh, pull request tests. And then need to do some, uh, some hack to pass the test run ID to publish it on the, on the bash environment so for the next slots to, to pick it up so that the next execution knows to which test run uh, plan it needs to report. So we trigger all these and in the end we have a little script that just pulls the results and once all are in uh, it terminates the, the Jenkins the Jenkins job. Um, yeah, so we have we've written some some pl some Maven plugins to to make our lives a little bit easier. Uh, I'll share the links later. We have uh, there is the plugin that uh, does the the parsing from feature files to JUnit. If you use TestNG, you can use the same. Just the the template would be would look different. Um, there is another one. Uh, for the test rail Maven integration, this is just a very basic uh, demo. What we do is a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, but basically, if anyone is in a situation where you need something like this, it's it's all on GitHub, and you can. It should be enough information there to get it running and to to have a good starting point. And the last one we also. Um, we're also using there is one for AWS device form so that we don't need to to have additional scripts we just wrap it all in one single maven execution which does uh, the, uh, generation of the JUnit files the packaging um, creating the uh, test rail execution and then triggering AWS so basically our whole test run is done in a script that in the, in the end is still less than about 10 lines of code. Which will, brings me to my, to the third learning. Uh, yeah, or maybe uh, cover that later. Uh, so third one, mm, I think we already covered most of that. Uh, when we do evaluation of what cloud provider we wanted to use. We had like a huge metrics of which phones does it support, um, how often are there updates, how fast it is, performance costs and whatever. What we didn't look into so much and in hindsight would actually, if I have to do that again, this would be my number one criteria, how good is the API? Does it have an API? It's nice if it comes with all sorts of plugins like uh, AWS has a quite good uh, Jenkins plugin. That's good. Uh, but if you don't know all the requirements you have in the future, so if there's anything that the tool cannot do, and it's quite likely every no software is perfect, then you need to have a tool set to extend it. So for that, you need a good API. So that's actually my number one tip. If you look into uh, moving your tests to the cloud, see what can you do with, with their API. Yeah, and so to uh, to conclude, mm, so maybe bonus learning. Uh, some of the best practices we came across while revamping our our test automation. Um, so there's always this distinction between: Are we doing QA? Are we software engineers? In a lot of places, these two seem to be like complete different people looked at a complete different way when I think it should be like we're all engineers, we're all building software. And 
many times if you look at the code in test automation solutions, it's, just, it's a lot like uh, pieced together, copy pasted, spaghetti code kind of, kind of thing. And it works for some time, but once you want to extend it, it can bite you. It can bite you quite bad. So we aim to write clean code, make sure it's maintainable, which is like completely, uh, we can all agree that that's important for production code that you ship to your customer, but we should also extend that to the code we use internally. So I yeah, don't need to go into too much detail here. Um, yeah, another thing, uh, please make sure we, we document what we're doing because uh, fluctuation is also happening in, in QA and just because I know what I did today doesn't mean I will, I will still know a week from now uh, what the hell I've been hacking together. So especially like solutions we have here is kind of fi making our way around some of the uh, some of the issues we, we found and it's quite important to do it in a way that's properly documented and uh, you can, can build on in the future. And maybe just a uh, personal note, I always find it important to share what, what we're doing and yeah, as much as we can, we try to open source so people are running into similar problems, they can <coughs> they can pick up from there. And if you read through the forums with all these uh, cloud providers, everyone is, is having the same issues. So if someone goes through the pain of solving it, then I just feel it's, it's good to, to share to everyone else. Yeah, and so just final slide, I mentioned it before. It's maybe not too much related to the cloud uh, presentation. I don't like the, the name that's been called QA. I think everyone in whatever company should be um, accountable and should feel responsible for the quality of the software and we should all, we're all just engineers. So I like the term automation engineer a lot better. And if you have a software development mindset when you do test automation, I feel you can do a lot of, a lot of great things. Okay. So that's it. I um, uh, just also want to share, uh, Sham has set up a Slack channel for the, for the meetup. So we can stay in touch. If you have any, any questions, you can also contact me directly. I will, we will share the, uh, the video, we will share the, the slides. And yeah, and if you have any also suggestions for, for future uh, talks, it would be interesting. Just, just let us know, get in touch. So before I hand over to Sham, uh, I mean, we have a Q&A at the end, but if you have any questions now, we could. So how do you actually spread your test? Uh, because you need to actually run all your tests on Android and iOS. We are mentioning you're dividing into 25, 25, 25. Mm -hmm. So it should be actually, like, uh, like is it the same framework where you have uh, like iOS and Android, uh, all the like, parts, everything is the same, and you're just um, yeah, so the, there are a couple of couple of things here. Uh, some of them we we discussed in the uh, you know in our last uh, meetup. Let me just follow up on this a bit. Um, so one thing to we use the same framework for both Android and iOS. Uh, and we try to, like all the feature files, all the features are for both, for both platforms with some uh, exceptions when one feature is only there for Android, for example. The way we, we do the, the XPath or the, the locators, we try to use IDs and, and CSS only. Uh, we have different annotations for Android, for iOS, and this one is for web, for Selenium. And we use a page object pattern and we reuse the page objects across all the platforms as much as it's possible. Sometimes, uh, like for example, the coin page again, 
there is a coin page for Android which overrides some methods because it behaves slightly different. But in an ideal scenario, and especially between Android and iOS, the two are pretty much not the same, but they're very, very similar. So the only thing that's different is uh, the, the locator. And then when it comes to uh, how do we run these tests, I actually forgot to, to show this. When we do the parsing of the feature files, we can filter by tags. Uh, say, uh, I want to run Android, then I just um, generate JUnit classes for everything that's tagged with Android. So this one, for example, OK, this scenario is there for Android, for web, and for iOS. Others, yeah, they just have Android and iOS. So let's say I want to run for, for Android. So I filter Android. And then the other tags are actually these uh, different slots we talked about. So for Sanity, we have uh, right now four different slots. So at some point, we I mean, that's the downside of it. We need to go through all the feature files and tag them. OK, this scenario is in slot 1. This scenario is in slot 1, too. Let's find one that's somewhere else. OK, unlucky. Yeah, but you can't believe me, we have, we have them all uh, split up. And actually, this is also this is the, the link to, to test rate. Right? Sorry? Yeah, that's the link to, to test trail. So, but coming back to the, to the filtering, if I run like this, it will only generate, uh, where is it? Oh yeah, here. So it will only generate Everything that's Android and uh, actually not because I need to clean before. You can also see that it works pretty fast. Uh, so these are just these five. If I say I want to run, let's say the next slot. So, the, and then when we when we upload to AWS, we only upload, uh, these yeah, these five that we want to run, and we specify with every run um, through which tests are in the in the file. These are the tests that should run, and then we specify which device we want to run against. And if that's an Android device, then we we need to make sure we upload the, the correct tests and the correct uh, APK file as well. So, so um, where is it again? So we had, you saw these uh, parameters. This is the project in AWS. And then AWS is something that's called a device pool. Where is it here? So you assign. Uh, actually, you can assign multiple devices, but we only use one. And say so this device pool has iPhone 7 Plus, for example. And if I specify uh, this test should run against this device pool, then it will run against this iPhone. And this way, I can uh, I can decide which tests to run on which device. And what was the downside of the having a real device from like we mentioned every six months you need to buy a new phone so. What, what was the problem it was causing? Uh, it gets quite expensive. You don't have flexibility when you want no, to... What, what happened to the phone? Like, you, as you are running the test and you may see, what happened to the phone wherein you have to buy them every, every six months? No, the reason why we need to buy every six months is because we want to test against the latest phone. It's not that anything happened to the phones. It's more you want to make sure your, your application works with the latest phones, with the latest uh, Android version, with the latest uh, iOS version. And 
Also, you want to make sure it works with older phones that maybe more people are using. And if you have a device farm, you have more flexibility because they can always target different devices. If I want to test against 20 different devices in my own device farm, I need to buy 20 phones. And there, let's take um, AWS device farm on the public cloud. You just uh, buy certain slots. I have five slots for, for Android and I can decide, I can use whatever Android phone I want. And I can change that and say, okay, maybe next month I want to target different phones. So you're not um, stuck with a particular type of phone. And how much time it has taken up for execution of the test? Like, let's say Android test, like we're like, for all the tests, probably three, four hours. But it depends. It's, some of the scenarios are quite, quite large also. Uh, and then we are not 100% done with uh, um, making sure all the tests are performing well. So we know that we have potential to reduce that, maybe even by 50%. But it's not such a big difference to running them locally. So we have these performance uh, problems locally as well. If you run on a cloud, it will be a little bit slower, but not by much, if you do with Appium. And there's always also a difference. Um, there are two ways you can do it. One is the AWS approach where you upload your whole package. And the other one is where you use a web driver that's just not local, but um, sends all the web driver commands remotely to, uh, for example, browser stack does that. Yeah. Uh, because they don't, they don't support that. On, on their public cloud, they don't have that. You need to upload. That's why we need to go through a lot of these things um, so that we can run there. The benefit of it is that it is faster because not every request needs to go... Uh, yeah, especially some of them, they don't have device farms all over the world, especially in Asia, they don't have. We have, like, AWS is... I think the closest is in the US. So imagine like every request needs to travel halfway across the globe. It's not much, but it slows it down a bit. Another one we're looking at was Bitbar. I think they told us the closest one is uh, in Europe. Um, I think in Europe, they, they're coming to Southeast Asia. So diff hmm? in Poland. In Poland, yeah. Um, so that's something you need to take into consideration. But I don't think it makes it a lot slower. So both approaches have their, have their benefits. So it's like $250 per month per slot, or the US? So it's uh, yes, I think it's 250 So actually you're buying one phone per month. <laughs> you pay one per one no. slot per month? He's having three of those slots. So four slots, uh, $250, $1,000 per month. Yeah. So it's yes, a yes. new phone, new model phone yeah, per month. Right. But, but it comes also with the cost that we need, we need some person to manage it. And, it. and plus we need a proper area where we can... Let's assume we, we buy like 100 phones. Uh, whatever. Yeah. We assume that we need 100 phones going forward or 50 phones. And we need to keep maintaining that server, maintaining it everything locally. And it, goes on, we calculate that cost and it goes on more than what we do spend in a year. Do you have any limitations on slots? I mean, how, how long uh, should your test go through, through months? So you can buy, run all uh, uh, all your tests during one month without any time limitation? There's no time limitation. If you have the slot, you can test as much as you want. So we're also trying to make sure we almost test 24 hours. So we make maximum use of the slots. What about the Upgrade testing? Are you doing the upgrade testing as well? Sorry, what, what testing? Upgrade. Upgrade. Uh, what do you mean by upgrade so testing? Update, like, from five to ah. Six. I mean, the... the, uh, the it's upgrade version, upgrade mm. version. Yeah. Are you talking about Android version of this? Or are you talking about the application? App update. Yeah, definitely. We, we, we do it every, every release. So, and it, it's automatic. How about OS updates? That, that oh, needs to be scheduled. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, OS updates, uh, if you look at like cloud, you don't take care of that. You just say, one day I want to test against uh, iOS 10, and then I test against iOS 11. How the update happens, I don't care. And that's also one of the challenges you would have on your local um, device farm, because you need different uh, versions, especially when some, some bug reports come in and you cannot reproduce on the newest one. And like especially with Apple, some you, there's only upgrade. You cannot downgrade easily unless you you know how to do. Um, so that's one of the benefits when you just have a provider that gives you a huge variety of different uh, combinations. Okay, uh, have you ever tried to test the simulators instead of real devices? Yeah, we, we did that too. So do you really need that you need like test only on real devices because like 99% of stations, simulators will also cover all the problems that you can find on real devices. But I've seen you will not find the real bugs on the simulator. Uh, no, you can find real bugs on the simulator. Uh, we had, we had a few issues before that uh, it was only applicable on let's say S9 version of uh, uh, where we, because we tried to reproduce it on, on simulators it was not able to find, and then we only were able to replicate on specific hardware version because it it, it was something to do with the, uh, the at that particular moment of that phone, that build version. Especially clicking camera, taking yes. photos. So clicking camera, taking photos. So do you have auto, uh, automated tests also for yeah. taking photos? Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah, I mean, we were looking into like some mixed approach where you use simulator and a few lesser uh, real devices, but we haven't followed through on that because then it also, also makes it more complicated because you need to support both. But it's definitely a valid approach if, you, if your app doesn't need anything that you can only do on a real device, like photos, or also if you need to shake the device or stuff like that. Uh, it's totally valid to go for simulator. It's the G motion can simulate also all these sections. <laughs> well, we have faced issues with simulators in the past, wherein a certain version of Xiaomi it was doing its own memory management quite ah. differently. So even though we were not using any of the camera features, we were having memory leaks on that phone. So it's it's quite simulators are. Uh, say, yeah. we need yeah. to do that's, that's where we decided yeah. also for one, we cannot scale up the simulator as well. How do you check the performance of the device? For example, you have raised like, uh, ice. Do you have any dedicated for memory check, the memory leak, or CPU performance? Uh, not, not at the moment. It was one of the criteria we looked into, but we haven't uh, got around to try that out with AWS yet. Is there any API to do that? Uh, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure. Some of the service providers gives you some logs, yeah. like how much memory consumed during the test. So they will give you some nice graph and the log frame. So, but again, you need to manually go through the logs and analyze what happened there and whether it was in, in which all actions it was in too much memory. When you swipe down too much, then it it it, it eat you more memory, something like that. So you need to manually. There is no ready system available like, okay, I just run and put this goes in need this much memory. There is no such perfect system. Again, there is uh, a actually, system. with Android at least, you can call, uh, you can check the current number yeah. usage every time. So yeah. during test, you can, like, yeah. after, after each step, you can yeah. check the memory. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, most no problem, most so of the uh, yeah. cloud service provides with that. Yeah. Yeah. iOS, I don't think so. With Android, you can you can help yourself. A wave, not really beautiful, it takes a long time, yeah. So for iOS, it's much easier to use manual tools for search for leaks. Yeah. It's worth perfect. Yeah, so that's why. Manual way don't have issues, but the automation way have issues. In terms of the swiping of the data inputs, or uh, the output? Yeah, <laughs> all, all sorts of them. <laughs> I think that takes uh, quite a bit of our time. Um, yeah, I think 
uh, take some experience also to figure out how to how to write the tests so that are not flaky. Um, but some things you you cannot you cannot cover everything. Um, some developer changed some locators again. Okay, your test will fail. But there are some more subtle uh, subtle differences between manual and automated. I think Sham has a lot of good examples for that. Um, yeah, it definitely happens. But also the other way, automated test find something that no one can reproduce manually. Which is even trickier because then your automation tells you something's wrong, but you don't really know what. Is it really an issue? Is it an issue with our automation, or is, or is it just a bug that no tester was able to to reproduce? Recently, we had an issue like uh, hmm? we cannot click on one of the buttons. It was working fine, so uh, but it broke. So what happens is that uh, what happens is that. Uh, the visibility property was false, set to false, and uh, we are not sure why it's false. So if you look at the application, you can still see this. You can click using your finger, but app using APM, you cannot click it. Was iOS? Uh, both. Android and, Android and iOS also, yeah. I have seen this in both these, platforms. These are some of the issues that uh, the Yeah, but have. there are workarounds. Like uh, yeah. you can go for precise click using coordinates. So what you can do, even though it's not visible, you get grab the coordinates and click using the coordinates will work. But obviously, you need to tell your developer to make this property as true for uh, for the visible as true, or you you can do it, or you need to request to developer. Yeah, so yeah. that thing need to be fixed. But this kind of issue can always happen. Do you still have a manual theme or you have only automation? But the issue is always the manual way. There's no issues. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we already we, we still do manual testing, but it's uh, less because Is it separate team or uh, it's the same. Same team. Yeah, but just uh, we have less time for manual testing now because we're focused on automation, and that's exactly that's one of the challenges to to move forward because I'm quite sure we're missing some some bugs because we cannot put as much effort into manual testing as before. And there are a lot of things that automation, especially if it's in an early stage, we're still in, even if it's 100 uh, scenarios, it's still quite early, that we cannot, we don't have everything automated. And a good manual tester will find a lot of things that automation can, can find at some point, but not where we are now. So yeah, I should also have to think, how do you balance these two? Um, the plugins I showed that those are on GitHub. The framework itself, uh, not yet, but during the uh, the last meetup, I presented something that's quite similar, the demo framework. Uh, that's also on GitHub and uses m some of the ideas that we, we use internally, most of them actually. And we are uh, planning to open source our framework as well, but it will take a while. It's, it's on the on the... It's in the pipeline, but I can't can't say when when we will be ready because we need to strip out stuff that's yeah. So uh, like currently, I cannot have these examples of Parser, and then you showed me the another example. I cannot have all those examples. No, the the Parser is available. The Parser, everything for the integration and in the in the build process. That's the, that I can share. Okay. So if you already have. Like cucumber tests or, or J unit tests, you can use that. I don't want that example exactly. Yeah. I just want the like how how it set is actually mm -hmm. designed and how it is actually structured. Yeah, sure. So the, that's all open source already. Um, we will share the links in the in the Slack channel and you can have a look and if you have any any more questions just, just contact us. How is AWS compared to Microsoft Azure? Uh, honest, honestly, don't have experience with Microsoft Asia. A few few months back, Xamarin was open source, and you tried still AWS. Nope. There was nope. a tool called Xamarin, which was integrating with Azure, and, and it was completely open source. Uh, we uh, basically we did not focus on uh, Azure because uh, we, we 
we had uh, it was very critical not to go uh, right now with the microsoft products at the moment that's the reason why and uh, and the problem also with uh, azure was we had to migrate everything uh, the build process and everything to uh, their side which we could not do because uh, for our ios build process android build process is completely separate and we cannot migrate everything over there then it would be very costly if any other questions yeah we've been looking into that as well so it was actually one of the one of the better ones quite happy with them so we looked into i think we had source labs we had browser stack we had bitbar uh, AWS device farm and P Cloudy and doing it ourselves that were the options we considered. Just a question, do you think that uh, if it's software, something is not working, then you can actually switch to something else, right? That would be best suited for you. So uh, just interested to know why you kept on using Amazon setting up the adapter. Is there any reason why, why you continue with Amazon? Uh, you want to take that? Okay. Uh, I think uh, we we had a previous tie-ups with Amazon, and uh, we have a good relationship with Amazon, and uh, they wanted us to try something uh, which uh, they were pushing us from last year. And uh, we want, still wanted to go out and evaluate what is effective, and but then uh, we still had a good support from their team also. So it was much easier. So about other systems, uh, like for example, uh, IBM AS400 in the insurance uh, systems, does it get able to support automation on those like live Asia or group Asia, those AS400 systems? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Windows? Uh, not sure, not sure. AS400 is like... Yeah, AS400. Like all mainframe main systems. Uh, no, pro no. Probably not with, with <laughs> Appium. <laughs> there, there are other, other tools we look into. We had some experience with uh, Silk Test, and some MicroFocus. Uh, it was uh, acquired by MicroFocus. Yeah, Micro they also bought some other test automation solutions, and I think they're the largest uh, yeah, largest the vendor now. But even they, with the distribution stuff we talked about, I think my previous company, we pushed them for two years before they implemented it. And they've been around for 20 years, and then like in version 17, they built that. But yeah, uh, for, for your situation, you maybe look into something like that. I don't think Appium can do it. Assisting, they can do it. I just looking whether Appium can do it. Yeah, I'm, I don't think so. But um, can have a look at that. I think Appium can do Windows. Can do no, sure. I haven't tried it. So we we only we only using Appium for for mobile applications. But I don't think uh, it's the right tool for that. Okay. So there are no further questions. Thank you. Thank you.